Wonderful, Anup. Thank you very much for that excellent discussion. Uh, I, I was relating to practically everything that you said because that is exactly what we are struggling at IIT, those of us who are trying the MOOCs and the flipped classroom model. So we don't have traditional videos. Later on in the conference, Professor Kannan Maudgalya will present his work on spoken tutorials. It's exactly like an eight to 10 minute piece with no video of the yeah. teacher. And we're trying to intercept the uh, interaction lessons and other things. And you know, Anu, what we found the most difficult thing in preparing that uh, talk, it's not like one hour talk, but designing the proper set of tests and examples uh, which will force some learning to the student is turning out to be the more difficult part. It's just like we spend enormous amount of time in setting papers, except we do, do them only for mid same and end same now, but we'll have to do it for uh, every hour of whatever. So, so thank you very much, Anup. And yeah, sorry. You know, one one must also take care of uh, the Creative Commons licenses because you use Khan Academy, for example. And Khan Academy says that you cannot create derivative. The moment somebody brings their derivative into the content, it becomes a derivative of Khan Academy content, and that's not allowed. So just. Because actually we are in the talks with Khan Academy and lots of Take permission from them. Yeah, what I'm saying is, so if you saw one of the bullets I had was modular content with clear rights. Okay, yes. so especially if you look at the government of India and content that gets created, there is no reason why you shouldn't have the rights. If you're building circuit simulator and lots of things, you know, there should be clear ownership and rights given to the community to access these, you know, elements and build upon that. I think we can arrange uh, in, in IIT, we have taken an in principle decision that all courses which will offer on MOOCs will be open source under Creative Commons by attribution license mostly, but at the most share alike. So these are, yeah, Preskincher. Yeah, yeah, I think I know. There are a lot of questions. Actually, it is not a tradition to ask questions after a keynote address, but we'll make an exception in case of Anu. We will rarely get him here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I read somewhere that uh, you can do only three of these four, and the fourth has to be left to which or one of them. I don't think you can put all the four together uh, with uh, all the constraints. That's a great point. Um, yes. You know, with their constraints. Yeah. Uh, Professor Jain. So most of the discussion, in fact, criticism of the moves, focuses around the fact that it is passive and it is important. There is an alternative model that we talked about. And that is a small private, which is box. Yes. So let me find the question then. Yeah. So the question that uh, Professor Jane is asking is that one of the criticisms of MOOCs is the fact that it is massive, okay, and it is open, and it's very hard to sort of say, you know, it depersonalizes, and this new notion of Spox, small private, you know, online courses that are there. And I very much agree in the blended tradition and things. And, you know, even MIT and Harvard and everybody will say, you know, we're using it for our own students too, where they can learn. So part of, again, you know, in the Samsara Athena project that I talked about is to make that feasible, what you have to do is you have to lower the cost. It means one is you have to make it simple, you know, so every teacher can author because everybody doesn't have videographers and everybody continuously doing and updating things. So you want to allow everybody to do. And in fact, our model really is that teachers in K through 12 through colleges will assemble things, teach their own people. Again, it doesn't mean that textbooks, you know, just like textbooks, MOOCs have their place and they will be useful, but Spox will play a very important role too. And the right tool sets and services can really help, help in that. I'm tempted to add that our model of blended MOOCs precisely expands on this, but it is still large scale. So we have a very definite role for local teachers who will engage the students in a flipped classroom model, 
the MOOCs course will be offered from IIT Bombay, but local assignment, local evaluation, and local interaction will be done by teachers. And to make those teachers empowered, IIT Bombay will be training them for two weeks in this model. That's exactly what we're proposing to do as an experiment. So let me invite uh, Gillian Caldicott from British Council to make a few special remarks. Uh, again, I will not spend too much time describing her. She has been working with British Council for 25 years. She has worked in several countries, uh, Syria, Egypt, last was Portugal, now she's in India. Interestingly, she has also worked in England, in London for some time. <laughs> All yours. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm very struck by these words, access, scale, and quality. And of course, um, taking into consideration costs, because that's exactly the sort of uh, issues that we face in the British Council. We've worked around the world for 80 years, and we're present physically in 100 countries, and virtually in more than that. And we, our aim is to build trust and understanding between the people in those countries and the UK. Um, and we work mostly, as I'm sure most of you know, in the fields of arts, English, and education, helping people to build their dreams, to build their aspir and to achieve their aspirations. And so uh, we're very, very pleased to be partnering uh, you, um, particularly the Ministry of, of Human Resource Development, Planning Commission, IIT Bombay, and Microsoft on this conference, because we think that the sorts of topics that you're talking about at this, this conference are key to the way the world will run in the future. And I can only say that increasingly, that's how we're working in the digital space and it is our aspiration to uh, you know, give universal access, to achieve scale, at quality, and to minimize costs in the way that we work. Um, I'm very pleased to say that um, Professor Mark Russell is here with us. Uh, he accepted our invitation and has come from King's College London, and he'll be giving a keynote speech um, tomorrow morning. So I do hope that you, you, you will be coming along to that. One of the things I wanted to, to, to emphasize was what we feel are the importance of partnerships. And the UK does have experience in this field. And we are interested, I'm talking on behalf of the UK here, we are interested in building those relationships, building those partnerships. You have a lot to offer, the UK has a lot to offer, and if we work together, we can achieve much more. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the UK now. There's been um, a amazing expansion of access to higher education, uh, as we all know. And um, the UK has achieved this, um, largely by looking at um, innovation in the digital world. Uh, so that's why we feel that there is a lot of sharing that could happen. I I'm going to talk about one example that I I'm particularly fond of, and it's the Open University in the UK. And an, I'm personally an alumni of, of three universities in the UK, and, and the Open University is one of them. Um, as you probably know, it's... Uh, the UK's biggest university now. In other words, it's achieved that um, ambition of access to many who didn't have access previously uh, to higher education. Uh, it has, in fact, over um, half a million students, or quarter, sorry, quarter of a million students, which in the UK sounds a lot. In India, it doesn't. I'm aware of that. Um, I know that your own open university, I believe, has around um, four million students. Uh, the Open University has taken on the challenge of providing teacher education here in India. And I was at a, a presentation just very recently, this last weekend, uh, about this. And it was very interesting. They, um, in collaboration, are uh, delivering teacher education across seven states in India. And um, that project, which is called TESS, and is funded by um, DFID, is achieving uh, access to one million and providing access to one million, uh, one million teachers through the seven states using technology. And a lot of it is using mobile technology, which I think is um, where we need to go. 
The Open University, of course, is no longer an exception in the UK. I think nearly every university uh, in the UK aims to deliver outstanding student experiences using technology to help them achieve their goals. And you'll hear more about that from uh, Professor Mark Russell, Russell tomorrow about the King's College London experience. Um, the government, too, in the UK has had a big role to play in supporting academic institutions. And I know that that's a very important relationship that you, are, um, you, that you have here in India as well. And again, it's that, that sense of partnership and how we work together, uh, government, education institutions, and across international, international, um, uh, international borders, that achieving those partnerships together, we will achieve more. The UK um, now has its own MOOC platform. It's called Future Learn. I hope that some of you know about it. It, um, it, it was uh, fairly recently launched, and the British Council, in fact, is a member, and we will be putting our materials on, on that MOOC platform. There are also 26 of the UK's universities on this platform, as well as the British Library, with its outstanding and amazing resources, and the British Museum. So that together makes an, an amazing um, partnership, I think. Uh, but what FutureLearn want to do is to reach out uh, to other countries and to include universities and institutions from other countries as well. So I hope that you will consider uh, partnering with FutureLearn. They're very keen to get some Indian institutions as partners. And, Fu and FutureLearn, in fact, is owned and managed by um, the Open University uh, in the UK. Um, finally, um, I I'll just tell you how the British Council, in the last couple of years, has been actively engaging with IGNU, the Planning Commission, MHRD, and the EU on programmes that raise awareness and build capacity in support of the use of technology in education. And we'd like to strengthen that engagement further. So let me just conclude by saying I think this looks like a really exciting um, conference. I completely um, you know, sign up to your values and access scale at quality at an affordable price is what we all need. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the outcomes of the conference and I'd like to wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Uh, as usual, I think we are getting extended. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, change uh, Anand Agarwal's time because he has another appointment in Australia. So, uh, uh, Mr. Pavan Agarwal thankfully agreed to further shift his talk after Anand's talk. Uh, can you connect, Anand? So, just to introduce Anand Agarwal, uh, like uh, uh, Anup, Anand also has been a great researcher and a professor at MIT. Uh, like Anup, he also jumped into the corporate fray, except that uh, he has EDX now. As all of you would know, Udacity, EDX, and Coursera are three prominent uh, 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 groups which are actually offering uh, MOOCs all over the world. Uh, he could not come here personally. Uh, we have, by the way, a tie-up with EDX. Uh, Professor Devan Kakkar, as director, set up a committee last year to initiate activities here. And that committee deliberated upon various possibilities. And then finally, we signed an MOU with EDX. So what we will be doing is the MOOCs courses from IIT Bombay will be offered through EDX for global usage. But as I mentioned, since EDX is an open source platform, and in no small measure, that fact was one of the reasons for our signing an MOU with them. We are adopting EDX through the MHRD support to make that adopted platform available even for local institutions to run SPOC, as you say, and even for IITs and other places to offer large-scale blended MOOCs in India on that platform. Anand, welcome. I already Excellent. introduced you. You have two challenges. <coughs> one is uh, one is that uh, your time has just been reduced to 20 minutes. I hope you can do justice for that. Uh, uh, without further ado, Anand, welcome. Please go ahead. 
All of us can watch it. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning from uh, Canberra in uh, Australia. Um, I, I apologize that I could not be there in person. Um, I'm here at a uh, Australian uh, education conference. Um, I'm hoping to give you a quick view about the edX, what we're up to, and uh, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, what you see here on the screen, I'm on slide two. Uh, what you see here is not a rock concert. So this is uh, not Madonna out there. Uh, this is actually a classroom, believe it or not, at the Obafemi Ovalovo University in uh, Nigeria. And we've all heard of distance education, but if you look at the people way in the back, you know, I would say that is much more like uh, long distance education. In large parts of the world, in large parts of the world, students do not have access to good quality education. Uh, um, even in uh, you know, countries such as India and so on, a lot of the students graduating still have substantial skills gaps. Uh, same thing in the US where the cost of education is extraordinarily high. So one way or the other, there's a real challenge with um, access to education. Um, edX is a site number three. edX is a nonprofit venture. It was founded by Harvard and uh, MIT. And we have a three-part mission. The first part of our mission is to expand access to education for everybody in the world. So everybody should have a quality education. Education is an absolute basic human right. And we felt that doing it as a nonprofit venture was the right way to do it. The second part of our mission is that we want to improve the quality of our education. Um, education really hasn't changed a whole lot since the printing press. The printing press and textbooks were the last big revolution in education, and we really haven't done much. So our goal is to see how we can improve campus education at the same time. And the third big part of our mission is to do research using things, big data that we are collecting on the uh, edX platform. Slide number four. So one reason why MOOCs and massive open online courses that you see on edX.org and the other MOOC providers have really drawn a huge amount of worldwide attention is the sheer numbers. When we launched our first course on edX two years ago, uh, this was a course on circuit and electronics uh, with differential equations and so on as prerequisites, one of the hardest courses at MIT. And still, we had uh, 155 students, 1.5 lakh students, sign up from 162 countries all over the world. Uh, this is a big number. You know, this number was bigger than the total number of alumni of MIT in its 150-year history. 7,200 students passed what was a very hard course, and 7,200 is also a bigger number. I would have to teach at MIT for 40 years before I can teach this many students that got a certificate by passing this uh, very hard course. Um, edX, uh, over the past two years, um, has been having a good impact around the world. Uh, we, today, we have uh, uh, we have gone well past the 1.8 million number uh, learner mark. We are close to 2 million learners from uh, 196 countries. This is every country in the world. Uh, we partner with some of the best institutions in the world that offer courses on edX. I am on slide number six now. Uh, we are partnered with the universities like MIT Harvard, Berkeley. Uh, from India, we are partnered with uh, IIT Bombay, and we are in discussions with uh, uh, several other uh, top name universities in India, like the IITs and uh, BITS, Pilani, and others. Uh, also in China with Tsinghua and uh, Peking University. Um, I'm in Australia visiting two of our partners, uh, Australia National University and uh, the University of Queensland, all great universities. And uh, they offer courses on the edX platform. Slide number seven. So we started with one course in uh, two years ago. And today we have uh, 150 courses on the platform. Uh, courses get added weekly. And this presentation is uh, a couple weeks old, and today we are at 100 and, uh, close to 150 courses on our platform in topics ranging from business, history, law, uh, arts, music, uh, engineering, sciences, computer science, physics, mathematics, and public health, pretty much every field uh, that you might be interested in. And students can take these courses on edX.org for free. And uh, 
They can also get a certificate if they pass the course. Slide number seven. No, I'm sorry, slide number nine. Uh, we have been innovating in a number of ways in which students can get a value or, or get a credential from these courses. So students can take these courses with the audit track for free. If they want, they can also sign up for the honor code track for free. For a small fee, they can sign up for the verified certificate track. So what is the verified certificate track? So with MOOC, students can take these courses online and the verified certificate track addresses the challenge of verifying and confirming that the student is who they say they are. So what we do is when a student signs up for a course, we check the students, we use a webcam to take the photograph of the student's face and the student also shows their ID. We take a picture of the ID and the picture of the ID and the student's face are compared and verified that it is who they say they are. Uh, the same kind of check is done before any exam or other a major uh, grading event in the course. In the past, of course, to get a verified certificate, and edX keeps a copy of the certificate, which is digitally signed. So if any employer wants to uh, check the certificate, they can use the uh, a unique UUID that every certificate has attached to it, and they can confirm the certificate from edX. I'm still in slide nine. We've also been uh, innovating with uh, sequences of courses. So uh, we have what is called X series. These are sequences of courses. So rather than taking one MOOC, uh, we launched this in the summer about uh, seven months ago, where students can take a sequence of courses. Um, so for example, we have a Foundations of Computer Science, which is very popular from um, MIT. And if students pass the courses and get verified certificates from the sequence, they get a X series certificate. So I can think of an X series like a, a sequence or a program or a discipline, where they, or a minor program, for example, where they can show mastery in a given uh, a discipline or a given uh, area of study. One of the things that edX did as a nonprofit, um, the courses can be taken for free, of course, but what edX did in, in addition was we made available our platform as open source. This means that anybody can use the edX platform and take it and use the software and set it up themselves. Since we did that, uh, a number of partnerships have developed. So, for example, Stanford University uh, was building its own platform, and now they are collaborating with edX on the open edX platform. Uh, similarly, Google was building their own platform called Course Builder, and today uh, Google has uh, joined over with edX, and the engineering team working on Course Builder is now continuing to develop and add features to the open edX platform. So as one example, uh, the Google team added Instant Hangouts to the uh, edX platform. So we're really delighted to have partners like Stanford and Google working to uh, further the open source platform. Many countries have begun to adopt edX as um, open source platform as well. So for example, China was one of the first adopters of open edX and uh, Tsinghua University in partnership with the Chinese Ministry of Education launched Shuetang X. Uh, Shuetang X stands for School X, and uh, they formed a consortium of universities in China, and they're offering uh, courses in uh, the Mandarin language uh, using Open edX. France did the same thing, launched France Université Numérique, or FUN, and you can see that here as well, where they launched a French national platform for French courses using Open edX. Similarly, Queen Rania of the Queen Rania Foundation in uh, the Middle East launched EDROC. EDROC in Arabic means school, uh, using open edX as well. So we're seeing broad adoption of edX uh, all over the world. Japan launched JMOOC uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is a Japan national platform using open edX. And a number of other countries uh, are in discussions with ed edX, and we'll see another half a dozen to a dozen of these uh, uh, happening within the next uh, several months. Um, many other foundations do the same thing. So uh, the World Economic Forum partnered with uh, edX. These are the Davos people, and they launched Forum Academy. And so you can go to Forum Academy, and you can take courses from the World Economic Forum, also using the edX platform. Uh, I'm on slide number 11. Um, now let me move on to uh, slide number 12. What does an edX course look like? Uh, these are MOOCs, online courses. 
So, so uh, uh, what did they look like? Uh, what you see is a course from Berkeley on artificial intelligence. We replace in these online courses and MOOCs, we replace the lecture, the one hour lecture, with what are called learning sequences. And you see that the user interface element, uh, the little stripe at the top of the screen showing the learning sequence. So learning sequence is an interleaving of a sequence of short videos with interactive exercises. These videos can be uh, Salman Khan style videos, they can be recordings in a studio, a number of other techniques. And then we interleave them with interactive exercises so that uh, this kind of learning promotes a new kind of learning called active learning, where when you engage the student after you give them some information, uh, many studies have shown, uh, please advance the slide, uh, slide number 12, but uh, just please advance it. Um, there's a very famous paper by Craig and Lockhart that shows that learning outcomes will, be, will, will improve if students are able to process the information with exercises uh, interleaved with, uh, with uh, uh, content like videos or reading text and uh, things like that. So this is a very important way in which uh, learning outcomes and the quality of learning can be improved as well. Um, in uh, slide number uh, 13, so here you will see uh, an example of a student watching a video. This is a Khan style, uh, uh, Khan style video. And so here, students are able to press a pause button. They can rewind. And so students can pace themselves. And again, a very famous study by Mayer showed that if students can self-pace and be flexible in how they pace themselves, they will also do better than have a one-size-fits-all in a classroom uh, setting. Uh, let's move to uh, slide number 14. So one question we are asked uh, is, um, how do you grade the students? If you have 100,000 students taking a MOOC, um, and you know, uh, uh, I encourage you all to go to edX.org, and uh, uh, IIT Bombay has launched uh, several MOOC courses. So uh, Professor Deepak, Arun Deepak Fatak, for example, has launched a computer science MOOC. And uh, uh, there are a couple of other MOOCs from uh, IIT Bombay as well. I encourage you to go and, and, uh, and sign up, and, uh, and, and uh, very soon as they start, you will see what they look like. So one of the things, when you have large numbers of students taking these courses, how do you grade these courses? How do you grade the students? So you have to use computer technology to do that. And I'll show you a quick little video. So the edX platform has uh, grading technology to grade many, many different kinds of assessments. We can grade equations. We can grade matrices. We can grade, of course, we can do things like uh, uh, simple text and image responses and so on. Uh, we also have experience experimental technology that can grade essays. Uh, essay grading can be done by peer grading, um, self grading, or with artificial intelligence grading uh, using machine learning technology. So here, I'll show you a little video uh, on an automatic grading of uh, chemical equations. So uh, uh, please advance to the next slide, uh, slide number 15. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, just advance it. You see, uh, if you can advance it, I hope you see the video here. And you see a little video showing uh, students uh, writing a chemical equation, and uh, they get it wrong, they get a red check, a red X mark. As they get it right, they get a green check mark. And the green check mark has become a cult symbol at edX, where students are telling us that uh, sometimes they go to bed at night dreaming of this green check mark. This instant feedback in the learning process is also known to improve learning outcomes, where rather than waiting two weeks to get a homework assignment back, you are able to get instant feedback, and you can learn and uh, revisit your answers and try to uh, improve on what you have done. Go to slide number 16. Uh, the instant feedback uh, and the green check mark on edX uh, has reached meme status on the web, and uh, we were really delighted. Uh, uh, <laughs> our engineering team realized we've arrived when suddenly uh, we found this green check mark uh, meme on the web, uh, when you get the green check mark for all your answers on the first attempt. Uh, this is slide number 16. So, uh, so uh, this green check mark has, has achieved cult status on, uh, on the web. Slide number 17. Uh, on the edX platform, we're also investing in a lot of other technologies. You know, people say, how do you do labs? So we use virtual labs and simulation technology to do all kinds of laboratories. We have labs for circuits, for uh, gene sequences, for chemistry, for biology, and so on. So here I'll give you a quick little example of a virtual lab 
for a, a, this is a, a course on uh, the science of cooking from, uh, from Harvard. And so here, uh, it brings in gamification technology and really engages the student. Uh, please advance to the next slide. And here, uh, you will see that a student is able to select um, some kind of thing to cook, like a piece of tuna or a piece of steak. And they can set the thickness. They can decide how many, you know, how, how many minutes to cook on either side. And through simulation, uh, they get to see a temperature profile, a temperature gradient, and, and how well it's cooked and so on. And the whole thing done via uh, simulation. So uh, let's advance to the next slide. Um, uh, this slide uh, doesn't have a slide number on it, but uh, it says improving on-campus education uh, preliminary uh, findings. So on this slide, one of the things we do on edX, as I said, is uh, not only improving access to students around the world, but we also want to improve on-campus learning. And so a number of our courses are also being used in campus settings uh, where the professor is using the course as a new age textbook. Many of our existing university partners are using it on their own campuses. At the same time, many other universities are also using this course. So for example, the courses. So for example, the San Jose State University used the circuits course on edX and taught a campus course, where the students would watch the, this is a blended course, also called the flipped classroom. They would watch the videos and do the interactive exercises before they came to class. And in class, as you see here, they would be engaged in group discussions and uh, ask questions of the professor and also do mini quizzes in the class. And the results were um, surprisingly amazing. Now, traditionally, this course had a 40 to 41 percent failure rate at San Jose. And in this experimental course, where students were randomly selected into this class, the failure rate fell down to 9 percent. And then San Jose State repeated the experiment uh, again in spring of 2013 and then again in fall of 2013, three times with uh, with the very good results. And now, now this experiment is being conducted with, with edX uh, in a partnership across the entire California State University system in about um, in about half a dozen campuses. We're also working with community colleges where uh, we're using courses from edX. And uh, this is the next slide, uh, which is a blended learning pilot on it. And here, a number of students uh, uh, can be seen in the community college. This is Bunker Hill Community College. And uh, in the back, you see Professor Jamie LaRue uh, using a blended class with, uh, with uh, her students. And again, uh, very good results when, in this case, a computer science course from uh, MIT was used to create a blended class at a, uh, a community college uh, in Massachusetts. Next slide, the slide number 21. One of the questions we asked is when a professor uses a blended class and uses uh, course content from another university, uh, there's a lot of uh, worry among professors, you know, uh, and, and the press has been talking about, look, are you going to replace professors? I challenge the press and I challenge the people who bring this up to say, just talk to the professors doing this. So if you talk to Professor Jamie LaRue, who's an assistant professor at Bunker Hill Community College, she says, that her presence in the classroom with the students was critical. That she, she said that her students would never have gotten through the course without her interactive help and teaching in the blended format. So uh, at the end of the day, blended learning is not going to replace professors. It is going to provide new tools for professors to make the quality of learning much, much better. I would propose that MOOCs can not only offer expanded access to students in India. So for example, on edX, we have about 2 million students all around the world, and 13% of the students come from India. In other words, uh, from India, we have uh, about 2.5 lakh students from India alone on our platform. In the same way, many universities and colleges that are not able to find good professors and so on can use these MOOCs on campus in a blended model uh, in what is called a SPOC, or Small Private Online Course, where you use this blended course I use a MOOC content like a textbook, like a new age textbook in your class and uh, blend the classroom. And that can really, really improve learning outcomes as you saw in the examples from San Jose and the community college. Uh, next slide. Uh, this one talks about uh, on-campus use at MIT. So a number of our university partners are going heavily into blended learning. So at MIT, for example, uh, half the undergraduate students today by using the edX platform in various forms of blended learning. 
23 classes on campus are already using it. And this just started uh, about a year and a half ago. And the results have been uh, very promising. So, for example, Professor Michael Seema uh, blended the classroom with uh, an introductory solid state chemistry course. And about 400 students take it. And, uh, you know, uh, at MIT, in the fifth week of the class, the students are sent a warning letter if they're not doing very well. Uh, two years ago, 50 warning letters were sent. Uh, one year ago, 29 warning letters were sent. And this time around in the blended class, only two warning letters were sent out. So, so whether it's uh, San Jose State or Bunker Hill Community College or MIT, the blended learning seems to be very promising uh, to improve campus education as well, um, both through better engagement with a millennial generation of students and also through uh, the technologies that I discussed earlier. So here, as you see, a blended class at Tsinghua in China. So China has, is moving very, very rapidly in this area. As I said, they've adopted the Open edX platform across the entire, to create a national platform using Open edX. And uh, they are also blending the classroom. So Tsinghua is a partner, uh, just like IIT Bombay. And here you see a blended learning class on their campus, with they're re replacing uh, seats in a row with these learning circular desks for learning with the blackboards all around uh, the classroom. Finally, uh, slide number 24. Oh, uh, next slide, please. So this is the Tsinghua classroom with the, uh, 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 please go back one slide. This is the Tsinghua classroom where you see uh, 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 the whole classroom has been changed and uh, many universities are doing the same thing. I was at the uh, University of Queensland yesterday and there again, many of the classrooms have been changed into these blended classes where you replace long desks with circular tables where students can sit down in small groups. This is my last slide. And uh, the last slide, slide number 24, uh, slide number 24. I want to talk about research very briefly. So on edX, we're gathering all kinds of data in terms of how students learn. And I like to think of it as a particle accelerator for learning, where we are gathering learning big data. And uh, getting this big data for learning, we can do these studies using the big data. I just want to give you a quick example of one study done by Philip Buo across a number of courses. So on the x-axis, and his question was, how long should videos be? Now, you may think that video should be as long as a lecture, one hour. But he plotted various videos of length from 3 minutes to 40 minutes on the x-axis. And the y-axis, he plotted the student engagement. And what is amazing is that he found that, that the maximal engagement, this is the amount of time students spent watching the video of a given length. And he found that 6-minute videos were the most popular. They were watched for all of 6 minutes. As videos got longer than 6 minutes, and began to reach 40 minutes, for a 40 minute video, student engagement was uh, less than three minutes. So really, the, the, it, it decayed as videos got longer and longer. So we can do these kinds of studies and then really enhance learning for our students. So let me stop here and thank you all for uh, giving me an opportunity uh, to discuss learning and how we can improve learning both on campus and also increase access to learning through, uh, through MOOC platforms such as uh, um, edX.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. Wonderful talk. Recently, your observation that uh, students watch videos only for six minutes and longer videos only for two minutes has been a common experience for uh, those colleagues who use Flip Classroom here as well as that is what I'm going to mention. Society, um, uh, NH and that sort of oh. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Anand. We look forward to your other visit to IIT Bombay. Well, we are actually back to the original schedule in some sense, <laughs> which was changed. Uh, so may I request uh, my friend Pavan Agarwal uh, to uh, deliver his talk. Again, I will use only a 30-second snippet. Uh, Pavan is a senior bureaucrat, but is an extremely passionate thinker. Education has been his mainstay of thinking. Uh, curiously, an activity which mostly academicians do, he has written a book. It is quite popular and very well written about his vision of the higher education. Uh, 
if uh, Mr. Praveen Prakash executes huge projects in the country with the help of academicians around, he is the one who conceives most of them to begin with in the planning commission, and of course, very kindly makes money available <laughs> for implementation. <laughs> so, Bhavan, all yours. Thank you, Professor Patak. Uh, you know, I think uh, we, we I have been pushed down. The two brackets are being pushed down. Yes, you know. Sir. <laughs> Uh, uh, we take care of brackets. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, welcome you all uh, to this conference on behalf of the government of India, the Planning Commission, and the Ministry of HRD. You know, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kakkar, you know, for hosting us here today at a very, very short notice, and uh, for Professor Parter for organizing this conference along with Professor Kanan. You know, I think it was. A decision taken, I think, a month ago, three weeks ago, but I think uh, uh, really appreciate. I think we can pat ourselves in the back for the right decision taken. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, Professor Fartek mentioned, we in the planning commission, we do the dreaming part of it. You know, the execution is left to Praveen and Fartek and all of you. Uh, and uh, when you are pushed down, and some very thoughtful people have spoken before you. It often happens that what you intend to say has already been said. Uh, so, <laughs> a lot of it has been said, uh, and it makes me more confident about uh, my conclusion that uh, as we move forward, the biggest breakthroughs in use of technology at a scale will come from India. You know, while China, I think uh, Anant mentioned about China making rapid progress. But they have a language problem, and uh, uh, we must recognize that it is not so easy to address the language problem that China has. But much of India's higher education is in English, and therefore we stand a huge advantage as far as that is concerned. Uh, we all now recognize from the presentations in the keynotes uh, in the forenoon that uh, the higher education globally is at the cusp of change. And in the transformation that we see, the digital transformation of higher education that is expected to take place, and it is in at the initial phases of transformation, you know, will really make higher education very different enterprise as we move forward. Uh, what I present to you here is an Indian narrative of that transformation. You know, uh, we have done rather well as far as higher education is concerned. I think you can see the numbers for yourselves. You know, these are huge numbers, the rapid expansion that India's higher education system has gone through in the recent years. 5,000 more students every single day, nine new institutions coming up every single day for the last few years. And our enrollments are at 22, 23 percent, and how one calculates the growth enrollment ratio, Professor Mantha is <laughs> laughing at us. So, we keep contesting that. But we are doing reasonably well as far as gross enrollment ratios are concerned, considering the stage of development at which India is. Uh, India overtook in terms of absolute enrollment US uh, in 2010. So, we are the second largest system of higher education in the world, uh, just following, the, uh, following China. But, yes, the but part, acute shortages of teachers, and which is quite expected. When you expand very rapidly, the pipeline for creation of faculty was not created. So, it will happen only gradually. So, there is a huge shortage of faculty declining for a student expanding. All this has resulted in you know a rapidly declining standards of higher education, which all of us sitting in this room do agree. And I think it has been stated variously by the honorable ministers, by the National Knowledge Commission about the crisis that the India's higher education sector faces. We continue to face problem of ability to attract talent in teaching profession. I think the IT sector and uh, we can see in this room many young people who left teaching profession and joined the IT sector. So, the bright people have joining the corporate sector, but fortunately many of those corporates are now working in the education space, which is good. You know. And uh, therefore, in this conference, uh, we made it a point that we do get, uh, you know, participation from that corporate sector, 
which is creating uh, you know which is very very vibrant in India. Uh, affiliating college system which was devised 160 years ago uh, that continues to be the main organizational model of higher education in the country. We have limited student choice because of uh, our system is highly fragmented very small institutions you know uh, when you talk about colleges you will have just a uh, you know 20 30 faculty. So, you cannot offer too many courses to much of our student numbers except in IITs the concept of electives is very rare in the Indian education system. And then despite a large and expanding system of higher education we have continued pressure to expand access. So, what do we know? You know I think countries higher education requires some innovative solutions you know it is desperately needing an innovative solution if we want to move forward. Now, this is a, uh, I think a quote <laughs> uh, given Anup uh, you gave this quote <laughs> this is Thomas Friedman in 2012 the big breakthroughs happen when what suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. What is desperately necessary in the country is innovation in the education higher education space and let me come to professor Kincha you know we have been in the planning commission thinking about this issue of how does one address simultaneously issues of access cost and quality or scale and I think this is the only way forward. The technology does offer us uh, uh, if we use it effectively a way forward to address these challenges together. And what is there in the technology space? Connectivity you heard professor Raghavan you know that sudden you know that a, that a impromptu meeting with him a decade ago uh, gave birth to professor Raghavan's uh, national knowledge network which can beat uh, Anant Agrawal's presentation that we just saw. So, I think the quality of that presentation. <laughs> Skype. <laughs> okay, so, we have the technology, we have the connectivity in place and uh, a much larger number of institutions are going to be connected as we move forward. In terms of access devices you all of you got in your bags Akash and a uh, um, better version of Akash is in the offing and I personally was very very impressed. My child my son 11 year son he spends 5 hours every day playing games on that you know. So, this is a problem, <laughs> but <laughs> so Akash is a wonderful device it can basically change the paradigm of higher education in the system and uh, there are many such uh, innovations in the country. Content we started national program on technology enhanced learning with the IT Madras professor Mangal Sundar and professor Anand. And uh, I think uh, uh, we have a large volume of content available at least for engineering programs, virtual labs which were started in the, under the NMICT you know. So, they are also very useful e kalpa for design education. So, lot of stuff is available which has been created in India and in addition to that a large volume of content is now available from around the world and which a large section of Indian students can use if we, if we put our things together. <coughs> Capabilities I think I need not uh, <laughs> you know refer to it yeah our young people are very very comfortable with technology. Both Coursera, edX Indian student community is the second largest user, user community worldwide. And finally mentioned before you know a very vibrant uh, private sector. I think some of them are here and they will be making short presentations in the groups and very very interesting stuff is happening in the country in the private space in the private higher education space so to say. So, we have a very robust technology ecosystem in the country. Now, what is suddenly possible and this is what Anup you mentioned about digital transformation. I think all these things are pretty new you know correct me if I am wrong even globally in higher education space you started talking, talking about learning sciences learning analytics, MOOCs, flipped classrooms, active learning you know. So, all this is pretty new I think 2, 3, 4 years old and India is not way behind in that. So, this is suddenly possible a new way of how higher education should be organized 
and how higher education can use technology effectively. Though many of the technologies that higher education today is using, they have been there for several decades. But the whole concept about learning and understanding, you know, how do we engage the students is, is pretty, pretty new. So, that is the sudden development that has taken place and marrying these two together, you know. <coughs> so, the way forward is for India to connect the dots and uh, as we have been having conversations with the uh, Praveen and NMICT people that all that is available, how do we connect the various dots, how do we align, how do we have a strategy which can deliver transformation of India's higher education sector. How do we enable things to happen? We do not have to make things happen. We have to ensure that we enable our institutions of higher education to do things which they are supposed to do. How do we turn constraints into opportunities? I think one of the basic binding constraint of India's higher education sector is the affiliating college system, but that also offers a unique opportunity for the sector and Anup you mentioned about it. Because you know hundreds of colleges are affiliated to the same university, they are delivering the same curriculum, the examinations are conducted by the university. So, that offers a unique model or hub of a hub and spoke, where high quality instruction can be delivered to remote colleges of equivalent quality, of a reasonably good quality. And it addresses in some ways the quality faculty shortages that India's higher education sector faces. So, we have to figure out that how do we creatively use our constraints into opportunities in the higher education space. And finally, you know I think uh, how do we, I think teaching will no more be transmission of content and we all agree to this. But unfortunately, this is how the India's or higher education systems or education systems worldwide are currently organized. How do we transform teaching to engaging students, so that we develop their understanding. So, I think this is a big transformation as we uh, go forward. Some of uh, the interesting initiatives that are already in place, Professor Fartux, a massive uh, teacher training initiative, quality enhancement in engineering education, Professor Junjunwala is going to be here with us tomorrow talking about how we are trying to improve the quality in 100 second tier engineering institutions. We have a team from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, you know, Arthi uh, can argue no end about how social work is different from engineering. But I think they are, they, you know, under leadership of Professor Pursuraman, we are trying to figure out how we can improve the quality in social work education or in commerce education or biosciences education, you know. And we have a very interesting initiative which is going to be approved on National Mission on Teachers and Teaching, which is primarily looking at teaching at the heart of improvement of quality of India's higher education sector. And a whole lot of initiatives and new institutional arrangements are part of the thinking on national mission on teacher and teaching. Now, the next three slides are about the strategy. You know, what is, what could be the strategy? How do we align various things at the institutional level? You know, the infrastructure, connectivity, access devices, content, faculty capability, motivation, incentives assessment policies, institutional policies, external policy environment, regulatory environment. How do we align all of it together, you know and that is a challenge. All that is available. So, how do we align all of it and to look at that, you know Professor Kanan and uh, you know Smita is sitting here. We are basically trying to learn from what is happening in the rest of the world. We are trying to map internal processes and practices within institutions of higher education in some of the best institutions around the world, National University of Singapore, University of Warwick, uh, University of Melbourne, along with what is happening in Indian institutions. And how these transformations can actually happen in practice, you know, by, by aligning all these factors to achieve the goal of using technology within the institutional context to improve quality. Next is at the system level. Interestingly, our system is organized in a hub and spoke model. Individual institution of higher education is not an independent entity. On the degree granting side, much of it is put all of it together. So, uh, much of the degree granting, degree awarding institutions, seven out of 700, over 200 are affiliating universities. 
that affiliate over 37,000 colleges. So, we do not have to reach out to all 37,000 colleges. If we build the capacity of those 200 affiliating universities, you are able to reach out to the large higher education system, large part of India's higher education sector. And this is precisely why we plan to have this event here today, focusing on technical affiliating universities, that around 25 of the technical affiliating universities, between themselves, you know, they constitute 95 percent, over 95 percent of engineering and road. So, if we can nudge and push and persuade them to do a few right things, I can it will impact engineering education in the country in a very, very significant way. Similarly, on the diploma side, you have the diploma, you know, councils, AICT plays a very important role. Then you have the state boards in many in nursing council, in, in the teacher education, you have regional offices. So, how can we work with these entities, which have a significant role in curriculum and examination practices in those diploma institutions? And we have to work out a strategy on that. Next. On the, the entire higher education system, if you look at it slightly differently by field of studies, you know, arts and subjects, which continues to, uh, you know, enroll the highest number of students. So, you have you know these can be networks mentioned about engineering education network, there could be social work network as I mentioned before, there could be you know a management network you know and we were uh, in discussions with I am Bangalore and I am Ahmedabad, how do we create a network of management schools in the country. So, they look at the curriculum content and pedagogical aspect in management education and create an ecosystem where uh, improvements can take place in business education in the country. So, I think uh, a system level you know subject wide networks or clusters could be organized and then uh, taken forward, yes. So, uh, uh, I think uh, this is my second inning with the higher education sector. A decade ago you know uh, if you heard professor Raghavan. Uh, a, a sudden meeting with him and then Professor Fatak I remember and Professor Junjun Bhala and Dr. Jagdish Arora. We started a few things a decade ago, you know, uh, and uh, which have made, uh, we have made, a, we have come a long way, uh, you know, in, in, in making a difference to the India's higher education sector. In our second inning, I do hope that by connecting to all of you here, Today, we can not only connect to Professor Fatak, we can connect to Anant Agrawal, we can connect to Anup through Vidya. So, I think by connecting to the right kind of expertise and uh, competences around the world, we can really create an ecosystem for most effective use of technology in higher education. So, that the digital transformation of the higher education globally basically changes the India's higher education sector and the constraints that we refer to can be addressed effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavan. I request uh, uh, Ravi Prakash to share uh, information about the science and Again, a very short 10 second introduction. Uh, Mr. Ravi Prakash is a media bureaucrat from the Andhra Pradesh cadet. Uh, for us, of course, the, the reason for closeness that we see is he is an alumnus of an IIT, he comes from IIT Kanpur. Uh, he has also exactly the same kind of patient that we see in Bhavan. He has been, ever since he has taken over as mission director, he has been pushing things ahead and ahead and ahead. I would just like to comment uh, on one particular thing which uh, Bhavan mentioned. I will share with you. We thank the institute for arranging this uh, uh, conference in three weeks' time and said that it is almost an impossible task. Sad humility, we have a motto here in IIT Bombay. We are not at all worried about the most difficult thing in the world. It is the impossible which takes us some time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As Pavan sir already uh, said, at the outset, on the behalf of the ministry, I would like to thank the IIT Bombay 
prof, uh, particularly Professor Patak and Professor Kannan and his team for organizing this event. Uh, <coughs> the day I was, uh, I mean, hinted that I will be joining the ministry, uh, I think the five days after that uh, particular event, I got a call from Pawan sir saying, You must organize an event for State Technical University. I was <laughs> so new to the whole, I never worked in education sector, the first uh, assignment in education sector, so why state technical university? And then I realized when I tried to understand NMEICT, the technology enabled learning, is that the engineering area is one area, we are, we are about to take off, I mean it's all the building blocks have been made and really now it's, it's ball in the hands of state technical universities, the journey which was started by IITs in in 99 and 2000. This is a time where state technical universities have to come on the center stage. So I will talk about my presentation, I will talk about, uh, will be in two parts, I will be talking about the building blocks which we have prepared, which have been mentioned by Pawan sir and other speakers also. Also talk about the role of and what we are planning to do with the help of state technical universities. As somebody mentioned, big challenge in technical education in India, if we compare from the, from from the, the year we got the independence, the number of students will be joining technical education every year. A year used to be around 2,500 and now look at the number, every year around 34 lakh students join technical education sector, which is engineering, polytechnic and all technical education is put together. Next. This also has been mentioned, uh, the recent study said that uh, the, the, if you look at only the vacancies, the number of vacancies in India around 5 lakh teachers in higher education, huge numbers. In fact, yesterday I was in, uh, in, in ICT, Institute of Chemical Technology and uh, I think the VC of our director of ICT has been asked to make a study by the Maharashtra government and his recommendation is, please do not open any new more colleges, so much vacancies are there, we have to find solutions. Next. And four years back, government of India thought that through ICT, these challenges, challenges which uh, related to, vac uh, to vacancies, not qualified teachers, not having a sufficient number of qualified teachers, quality of education imparted. The government of India thought that can we look at technology as, as a tool to find some, some solutions to these problems. And two big projects were approved in year 2010. One was NKN and second was NMEI city, put together 10,000 crore. Never in the history of any country in the world when such a massive funding for higher education for usage of ICT was given. And the journey started in 2010. Next. And I will talk about the three blocks, big blocks. First was the connectivity. It was thought that we will have a big network and in the network not only we will have a higher education institutions, but we will also have research institutions. And a, a network was created where around 1000 uh, universities or research, in, uh, research institutions have been given connectivity of 1 Gbps. The stand alone uh, uh, colleges have been given a connectivity of 10 Mbps and it is just a beginning. And it was said that if there is a, a good usage by particular university or college, we will upgrade the connectivity also. This whole network has been given, uh, it, as I said, it's point to point connectivity of 1 Gbps and an internet, internet bandwidth of 40 Gbps has been given. <coughs> Next. Uh, we said through connectivity, we reach up to the college or university and we must invest within the campus. So therefore, the, uh, the allocation has been made to provide the LAN connectivity, the Wi-Fi uh, 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 available uh, uh, connections, Wi-Fi uh, uh, features in the university and colleges. We want to reach out to every classroom, labs, hostels, whatever we can think of. Uh, around 400 nodes, we thought, theoretically we thought that we will give around 400 nodes to every uh, university. Till now, we have given to around 100 universities, we have given this land connections and we are very keen that every university utilizes this facility. Then we started making application. The idea was that centrally we will make applications and then make it available to all the universities and colleges in our country. 
the first application we have professor fatak here it's a a view app it's a application to do the e classroom online classroom uh, 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 we can do through this application we call it as a view using this application also we do this 10000 uh, online uh, training for 10000 teachers uh we also prepared large number of self learning e content uh the most talked about is nptel around 16000 video lectures each one of around 1 hour we also prepared virtual labs around 1500 simulated labs we also prepared we will have uh, presentations from different projects we also prepared self learning e content uh for uh, for courses which enhances the employability the courses which uh, also uh, uh uh helps the students to do the entrepreneurship work we also in the mission we also thought that let us focus also on some areas which are the emerging areas one such area which was identified was uh, embedded system and in under this project we set up the robotic labs in different engineering colleges and through which this embedded system course is taught we also as somebody said in the morning we also we also are focusing on on the issue of giving a e erp solution to every college and university we have prepared a generic erp solution which we know that we have to customize for every university and college we have also a presentation on this we have uh, we, we have subscribed around 1 lakh e books and e journals which we want to make it available to all the uh, st uh, students in universities and colleges the third big block is access device when this uh, when this uh, the whole thing about akash started there were a lot of apprehension that this access device is not useful for students of higher education it's good for school education students but not for higher education students for validating that we did a we did a pilot with 1 lakh students these devices were given to the 1 lakh students to around 400 engineering colleges and the iit bombay did that study and the finding is yes no uh, yes these devices are useful can take care of the basic ict needs of the students in even higher education sector uh, as uh, uh, as uh, it was said now we have uh, we have after the feedback on on this uh, on akash we have uh, we have upgraded it we are coming up with this akash akash 4 version which will be out in next 15 days next however uh, uh, the new projects which are in pipeline from the uh, uh, from, from the ministry next the one is uh, is a, we are going to start 50 new dts channels for every uh, for every area we'll have we want to have a channel for example in engineering we want to have a channel for electrical engineering mechanical engineering civil engineering next uh, we have a one stop portal uh, for sachar.ac.in we want to upgrade it we want a one stop uh, portal for all the higher education students of our country so that they can go there easily navigate and found uh, find all the all the e content which has been prepared under the different projects in the ministry we are also uh, talking about the way we have ignu in our uh, ignu uh, open university at national level we are talking about a virtual technical university uh, uh, at a national level next we are also talking about as uh, as mr arun from edx was saying if you look at if, if you look at books and what is the we uh, what is the the one v important component of books is which i read somewhere was the ivy league university is coming to masses if we have to make moocs a, a, a big thing in india it is the best institutes in india which has to come forward and start offering online courses we have a discussion in the ministry and we would like to request to all to start with all the centrally funded institutions with iit iim central universities to at least begin with one online certificate course so that's also uh, we are planning to start however all that blocks which you have prepared is a good will be only a good theoretical or academic intellectual exercise if if unless it it reaches to the students of 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 all the engineering colleges which are with the
state with the state technical university and how do we do that we have we have thought of one model but i am personally looking forward for for the discussions deliberations of this conference today and tomorrow next we have entered into a some mou with with around 11 uh, tech, state technical universities and the first indicator for me for a, a, a success indicator will be at the end of today's uh, this two days conference we will have from the ministry the mou with all the 24 state technical universities which are present today and what we are saying in that is that there there are different type of uh, uh, blocks or projects or, or activities which you have to take up in these uh, in the, in this project some we will fund 100% from government of india in some there will be funding of 70% 30% 70% from government of india 30 from state technical university and for some 50% from government of india and 50% from uh, state technical university uh go back so these are the name of the 11 state technical universities which have we already entered into mou last month next uh some of the areas in the mou which we have uh, we, we which we have mentioned which is which is not final i'm looking forward for the as i said the deliberation from this conference one is we are really 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 looking at the connectivity to the college uh, to the uh, to these colleges the land uh, work in the college We're looking at empowering training the uh, they training the teachers and the lecturers in the in those colleges and universities the looking at uh, make doing this whatever content which we have prepared we want to map that content with the with the syllabus of 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 that university so all that work we which we want to do and uh, do through this mou basically in nutshell what we are saying end of next one and a half to two years when we work together the ministry and the and the all state technical university we want in every every classroom either through asynchronous mode or asynchronous mode the technology enabled learning should come to the center stage of 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 learning and teaching methodology in the universities and colleges so that's our dream we want to work with all as i said the funding is not an issue now the the main issue is next uh and the and the and the and the rough administ administrative structure implement, uh, for implementing this uh, this mou is we want we have we have we have brought nitter into the picture the ministry nitter because nitter also the prime role of the nitters uh, which are all all four directors are here is to take this technical uh, technically uh, technical education agenda to the universities colleges and polytechnics so we want to have uh, so we are envisaging a structure where ministry nitters and state technical universities together will work to ensure this technology enabled learning becomes at the center comes at the center stage of every uh, college and university however it has uh, next it has lot of challenges and all the challenges have been nicely put in those in 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 in, in those topics which will be deliberating by the four groups uh one thing i i one thing which i when i visit to universities and colleges still i feel that education technology a technology enabled learning of different components of which 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 will make technology enabled learning happen in university and colleges have really it's not become part of of the whole system i mean that's one big big challenge which requires lot of policy interventions at university level college level state level national level that's one area second area we are talking about it empowering teachers with it literacy literacy what does it mean what level what does it actually mean by it literacy it literacy how do we empower them how do we enable them to accept it i think these are the big challenges uh, which we will be uh, discussing in the in the in in the, in, in the four group today thanks that's all from my side i hope i was within my time limit so i just to uh, share i had a very long presentation professor fatak told me yesterday night that he has both yellow card and red card so if i <laughs> if i cross the time limit he will show me the red class i i reduce the presentation and other than this 12 state technical universities the representatives who have come from the other state technical universities if any uh, if 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 you want more clarifications about the mou i will be available today and tomorrow also 
we'll be happy to enter in from the ministry side we'll be happy to enter into a movie with all the state technical universities well i i must say one thing please look at him does he look like a fellow who ever will get scared of red cars yellow cars etc etc so a special big hand for him for sticking to the task thank you so much